Hi everybody, welcome to Pi Podcast, the hidden figure of Python podcast series, which is done by the Pi Podcast team. And the goal of this podcast series is to highlight the voices from underrepresented group members of the Python community. And you can find us on the website. Our website is pipodcast.live and our episodes um, are listed on the PSF YouTube channel. And also you can hear it from Apple Podcast and Spotify. And we do have a code of conduct within our community. And we follow the PSF's code of conduct. Yeah, I guess well, let's start introducing ourselves. Um, my, name is, my name is Marietta. I'm one of the hosts for Pi Podcasts. I'm based in Vancouver, Canada. And I'll give it to you, Teresa. Hey, my name is Teresa. Thank you, Marietta. I am also one of the Pi Podcasts hosts, and I'm based in Hamburg, Germany. And Joanna? All right, I'm Joanna Jablonski, and I've been involved in the Python community since I think 2016, and I'm also based in Vancouver, Canada. Um, Joanna, so we know you've been very active in the Python world. So would you like to tell us a little bit, like how did you get into it? Like, and, and maybe also why Python? Yeah, sure. I actually had some friends over for dinner. I think one of them was a data analyst at the time, and I had been starting to play around with programming again, and he just happened to be really into Python, just the way that some people are very, very, very into it. He wanted me to try it out, and then I did, I think I took like a couple courses. I still felt very new, but I went to a PyLadies event in Vancouver, uh, the vibe was completely different from any other programming meetup I'd ever been to. Uh, I did not feel like I was being tested or anything like that. And I, even though I felt very new, people were just saying like, yeah, just make a five minute talk about whatever you're learning and come back. I'm like, what, what is this strange place I have landed in? But it was, it was really nice. And I feel like I got involved with it because it was there, because Python has a community in a way that you can't really necessarily say to the same extent about other languages. Uh, and um, yeah, that, that's kind of the, the background for how I got involved. And then since then, I got a ton of stuff. Because I met someone through PyLadies, he knew someone who knew somebody, and that played a part in how I uh, started working at Real Python. So I was there mm. for three and a half years. I ran the curriculum, and actually, the for the application process, I wrote an article about f strings. And I had happened to see Marietta, you gave a talk on f strings at PyLadies, and I saw that same talk again at Py Cascades. And so it's it was a lovely sort of circular thing. And I've spent most of my time in the Python community on some kind of ed education angles. Um, I wanted to ask basically, how do you feel like, so you said this, you were in the Python community and, um, you kind of, it sounds a little bit like opportunities came because you were in the Python community and, uh, more opportunities to be in the Python community. But then my question is like, did you have like work career related opportunities coming up from your, um, like what impact did your work in the Python community have? So to say, uh, in your okay. Work life, did, did, if it had any. Well, I feel, I mean, companies sometimes care if you're involved in open source. So that can be a tick for them. Um, being involved in the Python community was part of how I got involved with real Python. But I wouldn't say it's necessary. I mean, being involved in Python education definitely helped me work in education at Anaconda. Um, but it has also kind of felt like two separate tracks for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And while I've had my career going, I'm also kind of keeping this Python world spinning on the side, um, at least, you know, since I left Real Python, because then the two were together. Yeah. And um, I'm more, also more like about like, if there are skills that you kind of honed in the community and then brought back into your work life, well, I feel like I see other people who are really front and center in the community. Uh, 
for example, you two, Georgie, those types of people. And I always feel like I have been hidden in a sense where <laughs> I, I, maybe people have like seen the name or the photo or whenever I end up in some kind of tech space, uh, as soon as you, they hear the world real Python, they're like the whole everything stops. But I feel like a lot of people don't necessarily, like, I don't personally have a lot of visibility in the same way. I mean, I used to, I think people used to recognize me at conferences. That would happen and that was fun. I think we didn't get to hear about what you did at Real Python, maybe if, okay. because of the tutorial. Like, would you like to tell us more about, yeah. you know, your sure. work in Real Python for those who are not familiar with that yet? Yes. So the title is tricky. Um, executive editor. No one knows what that means. It sounds people big. <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, it, it either sounds very big or very small. Uh, sometimes people see the word editor and they're like, oh, this is the lady that does the spell check on my tutorial. And I'm like, no, I run the curriculum. Um, so that was interesting. I came in really early. That was exciting to me. I was technically the first employee. And I find that in general, for educational content having to do with programming, the bar is incredible incredibly low, uh, both in terms of, you know, sometimes even just like, is it factually correct? Are you teaching the right thing to the right person at the right time? Are you presenting the information in a way that is helpful? And so I liked that I got to come in as someone who didn't have a pure programming background. It's like, no, we can do better. And so you know, creating systems and style guides and didactic reviews, a lot of process to make sure that the stuff is good in ways that aren't necessarily, I think, prioritized in some other technical content creation spaces. And there's a lot of reasons why it's not that are that really makes sense. Uh, but I liked that I could come in and just say like, no, we're going to do this. And some of you will want to learn how to do this and I will invest more in you and that'll be awesome. Those people, you know, then they could like become full time. And it's a, it's a lovely little place where people get to just teach and write. It's really cool. It's a... It's an interesting sort of world in itself and there's the community around it and there'll be open spaces at PyCon and we had our like subs subscriber community in Slack and office hours and it really grew while I was there. When I joined, we were putting out, I think, one technical tutorial a week uh, and by the time I left, we were putting out two fairly lengthy often tutorials a week, which people in the community started calling bookicles. Uh, mm -hmm. Anthony Shaw's article on CPython's interpreter, I think, was something like 24,000 words. Yeah. <laughs> it's bananas. Um, so yeah, we're really, and it's not fluff, right? Like it's really, really juicy stuff because through the review process, we're making sure that it's not just fluff uh, for no reason. Mm -hmm. um, and the writing is tight and, all, and you're saying the right thing to the right person at the right time. By the time I left, we were putting out two hefty, really good uh, written tutorials a week, a video course, a newsletter, office hours, and a podcast. Uh, wow. So in those three and a half years, it just exploded. Uh, and book yeah. projects. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I co-authored Python Basics with David Amos, and I was also the primary viewer helping Anthony Shaw write his book on CPython internals, uh, which sort of started as an article and then we turned it into a proper, like a book book. Um, and that it was the missing manual. Like that, that was a very cool thing to work on, especially since um, in my background, I've kind of flip flop between STEM stuff and natural language stuff. And I like yeah. finding the overlap between the two. And I find that in tech, there is a special niche for people who really want to be on that weird overlap, which I can get to later. But I found overlaps with stuff like interpreters where like, this is a language. And you are, you're not just using the language, you're designing and building a language. That's cool. I also dabbled with NLP. And one sort of fun achievement on that end is that if you Google NLP Python, the first result is a tutorial by me, which, wow. you know, is very That's fun. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I used NLTK for it. This is like a bit, the, the landscape has changed, but it was pretty cool. And mm -hmm. also another very satisfying overlap between programming languages and natural languages is the education side, which is why I've found a place here, like sort of docs and education. And there's sort of a different companies will call it different things, but it's that overlap between code words and people and managing to simultaneously have technical depth, but have the other skills that make it usable and useful both for yourself and others. And that's interesting. Uh, yeah. So actually, I wanted to ask you when you were saying, uh, you mentioned that uh, you didn't just study STEM and uh, you uh, come from a different background. So I think my, both Mariade and I are coming from a computer science background. And we 
we've seen a lot of people in tech coming just from computer science. And I personally always like teams that are not just computer scientists in data science, at least. So can you tell us a little bit about it or tell the audience a little bit about your uh, life before Python? So my education was fairly focused on STEM for a while. So even though I'm in Canada, I went through the French school system. So they they have you specialize fairly early. Uh, and I went through the science stream where it's just all science all the time. Uh, you're not even taking French classes by the end. You're just like super zeroed and focused on like math, chemistry, physics, biology, geology, etc. And that ended up being kind of, I, I don't want to say unbalanced, but like literally technically unbalanced balanced because it was very far in one direction. And then I ended up sort of correcting into getting a degree in translation, which is incredibly puzzle based. So it was giving me the a similar experience, but in a different space that was like a bit of a palate cleanser. And so I feel like I've zigzagged a bit where I was hardcore on STEM. Then I went into translation and got a degree, you know, it's technically an arts degree. Then I was programming for fun. And then I sort of like the slalom reduced into finding a middle spot between the two, which happened to be useful for tech because there's a lot of, there are a lot of specialists and there need to be people who can kind of like bridge gaps, I find between the different specializations. Yeah. I think we definitely need like lots of different skills, different Everybody contribute in their own way, you know, yeah. having all these different skills makes us all better. Yeah. And I, I think I just want to add, like, I really admire what you did or what you did, yeah, what you did for real Python. I know that even now, sometimes in, I mean, a lot of communities, if I sometimes in, even in a PyLady Slack, somebody would be asking questions like, mm. how do I do X, how do I do Y? And then a lot of time I see the answer is that, oh, here's the real Python article wow. about it. Like that's being referred to a lot. So I think it's it's really impressive. Thank that's, you for your always, work on that. It's really fun to hear. Yeah, it's, and just the fact that it was, I mean, like it is, it has to support itself and it does. The fact that a lot of that stuff is free, that has to be helping people as well. Like I similarly was self-taught. And so like, yeah, I paid for some courses and, but a lot of it was just like, well, things are on the internet. Internet, I'll go learn. Uh, and so it felt like a neat sort of circular, like, oh, like I learned from the internet. I'm now providing to the internet and mm -hmm. other people will learn as well. Yeah. Maybe if you would like to tell us more about what else you do in the Python community other than real Python. Um... I worked in education and Anaconda for a while. I think I mentioned the two book projects already. Uh, one very cool thing that I did was cover the language summit for 2021. That was, uh, it felt like an honor. And it also felt like kind of like a lovely mesh of those two sides I found where I could make it like a proper like journalism tutorially, like really polished article, but also have it, uh, you know, reflect something that's actually useful and correct. And, mm -hmm. and that was very cool. But also I just, it was an honor to be like a fly on the wall. Not many people go to that. And I got to basically be a door for the whole rest of the community onto mm -hmm. that. And I took it very seriously and I really yeah. wanted to make the, sure the articles were good and I got lots of good feedback. And um, yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed doing that. Yeah, uh, for those who don't know, the Python yeah. Language Summit is an event at PyCon US that is usually attended only by 50 or so people, by mostly Python core developers. And so basically the people who have a lot of influence, I would say, to how mm -hmm. the Python language is like and because mm -hmm. of this meeting is not open to public having an article ha having blog post is how the rest of the python community can learn of what was discussed in the community so it's really important it's the only way we get to to share um what happened at the language summit without all the core developers having to write their own notes so it's really important so thank yeah. you for your help on that thank you happy um, to and there was another cool thing that happened at the language summit was uh the previous year i had read the articles and i'd seen that there was talk of creating the editorial board for python stocks and then in the year that i covered it i think Marietta, did you and Carol present both of you together on the topic? I think the three of us, I don't remember. Me, 
Carol and Ned Batchel, or we oh, all, yes, of course. the three yes. of us plan, wanted to have this. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so yeah. when I, like, I had read about it before, and then, but finally I was in the room where people were actually talking about it. And so I basically grabbed Carol. I was like, I have to be on this, please. Uh, it was, it sounded very much right up my alley, especially yeah. since the goals of the editorial board were sort of more uh, where it was less about like, eh, okay, well, like, we'll fix some typos. We'll see about this or this. It was more like, how do we make this? better for learners because people who are using python now are completely different from people who were using python like ages ago uh, since now it's people's first language just basically as a matter of course as part of their standard education and uh, so i started working with carol on that fairly slowly then and then just recently we published the pap to, and now we're really really getting rolling so uh, i'd say the main thing i'm doing in the python community now is going to be um, editorial board stuff actually yeah. what can you can you explain a little bit more about the PEP, PEP 732, if I get the number right. <laughs> yes, and that is Python correct. editorial board for those of us. I think most of us don't actually know it yet. Yeah, that's know. fair. <laughs> I'll let you explain. <laughs> fair enough. Um, so the it is, yeah, PEP 732. It's super short. If anyone wants to go check it out, just search PEP 732. Uh, so PEP 732 outlines the basic purpose of the editorial board, what it is, what it isn't, and how it relates to other parts of the Python world, because there are other people working on docs. Uh, and the difference between the editorial board and other people working on docs is that the editorial board is going to deal with more big picture stuff, strategy, and creating systems for people who are going to be contributing, basically to make it easier to contribute and to make it easier to learn Python. I have a question. So I hear a lot of, um, so since 2016, it sounds like you've been doing quite a lot. I mean, compared to like, it sounds like this would be for other people, like a full-time job, but I'm just kind of like ask how much time do you, um, uh, volunteer for, you know, Python? Like, I don't actually I guess know. You have... Yeah. It varied a lot. I mean, for a while it was like my full-time job, uh, for, through, you know, for a good chunk there. I mean, I can't real Python, it wasn't, real Python wasn't volunteering, but it very squarely put me in the center of things in terms mm -hmm. of Python. Um, otherwise, it's dipped and gone up. Re I think part one of the reasons it's possible long term is because it's slow. I have previously mm -hmm. described open source as like middle school, but slower. And so mm -hmm. it's, I, f I feel like there's very little pressure to get things done quickly. At least my experience has been things aren't urgent. Uh, that's has positives and negatives because it might take forever to get your PR reviewed and might demoralize people from contributing. Mm -hmm. But it also means that people seem to be fairly conscious of the fact that we're all doing this for free in our in our limited spare time. So mm -hmm. let's give each other a break. And sometimes it feels like every next word out of people's mouths is burnout. So simultaneously, it's a problem, but people are recognizing that it's a problem. So a bit of a meandering answer. But I think the fact that it's slow helps. And the fact that there's a general attempt to treat each other like people uh, in a very concerted way, I find in the Python community that really takes the edge off some of the more trying bits. I mean, if you're tired, or if you're frustrated, if everyone sort of keeps keeps their manners, then we might all continue working together, I think, much more easily than if someone just sort of swans off and makes things more unpleasant than people necessarily want, want it to be for what is essentially a hobby. Have you managed to avoid getting a burnout from volunteering? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone on this podcast will answer yes to that. <laughs> like, uh, so here's the thing. I know that the, right now in the market is hard. And right now, like, I don't, I feel like everyone's having a hard time. And I, when, a lot of them, when I talk to people, like, I can see the drain on their face. I can see the emotion on their face. They're really struggling. And I feel like most of the people I talk to right now are having a hard time. It feels like a very common experience. I just want to say, like, even in the last 
month I hear so many of my friends in the Python community. I don't know if I should say it, but they are burnt out. Like they're looking for different opportunities. Um, the the tech industry isn't seems like changing. Yeah, twenty twenty three seems to be like a strange year. I don't know when we last had a normal year. <laughs> I know, but it's just like escalating, yeah. you know, it's like you always think, okay, this was strange. And then the next year is like going like even more strange. And then you're what like, on okay, earth will so... next year be like at this point, like, I don't know. <laughs> it's, but no, but I, I mean, I want to add to it, which is that like, yeah, I feel like that's sort of a, an elephant in the room that we might talk about, or we might talk, not talk about depending on who we're talking with. But you know, other friends of mine have also just said like, you know what, I'm done with tech and they are fabulous, super accomplished. I can't believe they're amazing. Uh, and then they just like, no, I'm just going to go do this now. Uh, that is something that I'm seeing happen a lot, especially lately. I also remember, I have a very vague memory of some tweet uh, ages ago. Maybe some woman celebrating that she made it to, was it 10 years in tech because now she beat the average or something like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't remember the precise numbers, but the sentiment was like, I have achieved being slightly above average. Congrats to you, me. Something to celebrate. Yeah. Do you have any, maybe like, I don't know, things in life to balance things out that help you balance things out? Like other, you know, non-tech related things? Yes, definitely. I have gone in the extreme opposite direction in a lot of my other interests. I am very, very interested in Neolithic and Bronze Age textiles. Uh, and so I do a lot of research sometimes I make pieces based on archaeological finds uh, mm. I'm just like whenever if I'm not here I'm like doing something with sticks <laughs> like out far far away from here uh, but I've started like making yarn with a drop spindle and I just like I am really into just identifying moss and things that are the complete polar opposite of this That's yeah cool. like, uh, I also fun. like Neander okay I know You've asked me a topic. I have to like say one more thing on this, but like yeah. Neanderthal, yeah. Eating, eat, Neanderthal eating habits. Um, <laughs> yes. Actually, there's, 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 I think there's some, uh, either a YouTube channel or like some blog post about, you know, like Neanderthal cuisine, like bringing, I, I heard, I don't know, my partner was talking about that. It was cool. Very exciting. Or Roman, I don't know, something yeah, like, there's all kinds really of stuff. To... But if someone wants something to Google, uh, a really fun term is experimental archaeology because there are people. Well, Sally Pointer is a great one since we're talking about YouTube. But you basically you learn about fine, but you learn about artifacts by trying to recreate them. And by recreating them, you see like, oh, okay, so the loom must have been created this way. And incidentally, okay, one last more tangent. I have this one local group that I do a lot of ancient textile stuff with. And there's one technique that was that was called spraying, it was popular in the Neolithic. If you're asking someone on a programming podcast about their niche interest, something's going to happen. No, it's <laughs> okay. fine. It is okay, so I will tell you one last thing because this does circle back to programming. Um, but she, we're learning how to do spraying together, which is a, a Neolithic textile technique mm -hmm. that predates weaving. She was creating uh, little notes for herself for how she was so that she could recreate it and learn it. And the notes were essentially binary because it was mm -hmm. like, I moved it. It, she didn't intend yeah. to be binary, but it was binary, which also ties in with like how the history of programming ties in with looms. Like, yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm gonna... I mean, it sounds like <laughs> reverse engineering. Like you, you saw totally. something and you try yeah, to yeah, build yeah, it. Yeah. It's, it's reverse yeah, yeah. engineering, and a lot of it's geometry and like three D shapes and yeah. um, and it's like it's all math it is logic. and materials and chemistry, mm -hmm. especially a lot of like dyes and things get really finicky anyway there we go there's my niche interest for the podcast that sounds i fun. think we all need that and i think everybody needs niche interests to stay sane <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah i think that's uh i'm also into art restoration so that's fun and knitting i mean that's the other nice. fun. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome and i bet mariata also has some secret uh stuff going on or... i'm into food so when you nice. say like learning about you know neanderthal eating habit that's something i i'm interested <laughs> like <Nice. laughs> so sometimes i like even figuring out like how did people come up with this dish like i like to learn about the history like yeah. i 
I even learned the history of ketchup. Oh, uh, like the the word ketchup is a native word in my native language, like in Malay Indonesian language. We mm-hmm. have the word ketchup, but it refers to a different type of sauce. It's like uh, the sauce is usually dark sauce. Mm-hmm. Things you say soy sauce, that's ketchup. Ketchup, oh. salty sauce is like ketchup as in ketchup manis. So huh. sauce to me is ketchup. Some but <laughs> what? American things of get the word ketchup in my mm-hmm. language is tomato sauce. Mm-hmm. It's reversed. <laughs> yeah. We don't say ketchup with to I, I should, to tomato. Tomato <laughs> sauce with sugar. Yeah. yeah. With a lot of sugar. <laughs> Ketchup. Mm-hmm. But I, I tried to dig it up. Why did we have this same word? It turns out when the Heinz or whoever tries to come up with the name of their sauce, they they borrow it from, from Malaysian, from Indonesian. Like they take this word from us. So mm. anyway, it, it's totally random archaeology. <laughs> no, that's really cool. That's <laughs> it's all of the mysteries that you can find in words. Coming back to words and your <laughs> Tara, <laughs> and your uh, multifaceted interest in like computer science and languages. Mm-hmm. Um, I was wondering, like, how has this kind of come up in your work, like this intersection between computer science and translation and language? Yes, it's, um, well, I guess I found out that it's really useful. There is generally I find a big pressure to just be an engineer and like everyone has to go be an engineer and I feel mm-hmm. like people keep people are confused why I don't just go be a pure engineer but I've also found that the opportunities for people who can do multiple things like if you can code and you can talk to people and you can write and you can teach mm-hmm. and you can organize and you can learn whatever else new thing is required of you then opportunities might come to you fairly quickly and f- well enough that by the time someone's trying to hire you for an engineer role you might actually be making more than a junior engineer like just like it it just comes sometimes so there is definitely a need there's less the jobs can be weirder and less common so when I look at job postings I'm not just looking like look up like Django developer or like data analyst or something very structured I'm looking at all kinds of things and I I have often been like the first X at a company or been given a job like we don't know what this job is go figure it out uh which i personally find fun since you get to make your own job and kind of create some direction Mm -hmm. and agency for yourself but yeah there are fewer jobs like that than just you know i am an engineer but the people who are looking for you are also having a harder time finding people like you so Mm -hmm. it depends you know what path you like but i like this middle path there's a lot of variety and it also like it feels more social it feels like Mm -hmm. i uh, I can still move in a lot of different directions from here. I don't feel boxed in. Like I could still become a specialist as long as I still keep every door open. It means that I'm, you know, constantly learning a lot of things and I don't know what my next job will be like. And so sometimes I'm like, I don't know, should I get, should I take courses on instructional design or should I get my next AWS certification or should I do this or should I do this or should like I... Uh, I feel like that mentality might also be not uncommon among people who are active in open source who just tend to fill, like there may be a type who tends to fill their schedule uh, who I think might be drawn to open source as well. So that might be a recurring theme in these in these chats. And maybe I think one of the things that is also, if you're like open like that to different ex- learning ways and different ways of interacting with people, it's also opening up the space for you not needing to be an expert in everything. Yeah. Because yeah. you can collaborate with other people, you know, and yes. leverage that other people are good at something and you have yeah. to communicate to figure that out, right? So Totally. And then it, like, it helps you bring people together. It helps you accomplish mm-hmm. bigger things. And it helps you cr- like train people to replace you. These are all good things. Like These are all uh, signs of growth, both individually mm-hmm. and within a community and within a company. So that's the opposite. Like things that you can do to stave off stagnation, I think. I think it's actually a good thing being able to like adapt and being flexible being able to work with a lot of different types of people because it's it's not actually easy <laughs> yeah it's, it's hard working with people worldwide it's not um it takes a certain skill and intentionality to like being able to work together 
Yeah. Yeah. So what is next for you? You have, um, I think you probably have a sick, I think you mentioned to me you have a secret project or yes, something. Uh, would I you like do. To talk about it? it ties in because we just had PyLadiesCon recently and it ties mm-hmm. in with my talk at PyLadiesCon, which uh, was based on a, a really short skimmable article that I wrote um, called How to Make a Doc Site Shortcuts for Busy Devs. And that article was aimed at developers who are not particularly interested in making docs. But, you know, for whatever reason they need one, maybe they're, they have an open source project that they want to share, or they are at a startup that now needs to create its first doc site, um, and they just need to get something out. So in that article, I gave them a super short, opinionated, practical guide to have a path of least resistance towards just getting a doc site out that is decent. And I'm also working on sort of successor to that that is longer and more involved and is still very practical, but uh, is just a richer resource, like gives templates and checklists and systematizes the process of making docs to make it less painless for people who are not particularly interested in docs. Because if you are interested in docs, there are resources out there for you. There's the book mm-hmm. Docs for Developers, the product is docs, docs like code. But I feel like those books are for docs people who want to sit down and read a book about docs. Um, they're excellent. I own them. I don't have them mm-hmm. here. I had them here on the Pi Ladies <laughs> talk so that I could, yeah. if someone recommended books or asked for recommendations, I could put like, these two are great. Um, yeah. Or three, because I have. Anyway. Um, but I find that those have th- more theory in them than some audiences might have patience for. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to create sort of a very systematized golden path of least resistance towards making that. It's not not public. Um, I wasn't even sure how much detail I was going to go into, but apparently it all just fell out of me. <laughs> so no uh, that is something I'm working on. And okay. uh, yeah, I think that's, I don't know. I've been at companies, at startups, a few different startups where they have no docs at all, <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah. And because there's no docs, when it's time to offboard somebody, like when somebody left, there is this two weeks of grueling mm-hmm. handover. Like, yeah. tell us everything you know from two years into these two weeks. <laughs> like, I think documentation should just be done continuously. Like, it should become part of the work you do as you write code, you write test, you write doc. It's this part of the package, in my opinion. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's more sustainable. It is worth it. Do you, are you looking for testers for your uh, new project? <laughs> I will be. I don't have anything uh, to give them to test that I I. I need to be ready to share this with people. <laughs> yeah, yeah be, but maybe a step. Yeah. Maybe there's like a place where people can reach you and put your no, no, posts on a wait list. Yes, no, I would love that. That's an excellent idea. My handle on GitHub is Jablonski Dev, J A B L O N S K I D E V. My personal site is jojab.dev, J O J A B dot dev. Uh, if you want to find me on LinkedIn, just search Joanna Jablonski. I'm very findable. Um, and yeah, I always have happy to talk about developer education and docs. So hit me up. Uh, I would love to chat. Awesome. Well, thank you, Joanna, for speaking with us and sharing your experience. Um, And thank you for having me. And thank you for making this podcast. Thank you for it.